You're listening to the Australian Hunting and Beyond podcast with Matt. Where we talk about hunting, shooting, fishing, camping, and everything else that the great outdoors has to offer. Let's get into it. I love this time of year because it really is getting closer and closer to the rut and the raw. So I really wanted to get a few people on who do very well, in my opinion, regarding chasing fellow bucks especially. And tonight we're super, super lucky. We've got Dylan Smith from Wilder Life. Mate, thank you for coming on the podcast. How are you? I'm good, mate. Thanks for having me on. Mate, it's a fantastic time of year because I'm super pumped up. And one of the reasons I've been doing a few things, different things with the podcast is to promote it and get people excited about this time of year. Probably they already are anyway, but I figured, hey, what the hell, everyone can hear some stories and get some tips and tricks and things like that. So, mate, how are you excited for the rut? Have you been doing much already? Mate, I um, I get excited for each rut the day that I stop hunting the <laughs> the rut from the year before. So, I know it sounds stupid, but I, I th- probably think about hunting the rut every day of my life at some point. And yeah, I mean, I've been doing a lot of scouting on a new block, just trying to line a few things up, certainly um, with like family events over Easter and just making sure I'm going to be able to get out plenty and also... I'm um, talking with my wife about what our rut this year is going to look like because we got a well, we will have a six month old son with us. He's three months old now, so I just I want to make sure we can both enjoy the rut, but navigate what that looks like with him in camp or have him out with us or whatever. I mean, you're preaching to the choir here. Kids just change the dynamic a lot, and how much time you do have because you've got this other little human that relies on you. So it does make it a little bit more difficult. So having just had the twins, near near up to eighteen months now, so it's it's getting a little bit easier, which is nice, but uh, very very time poor. You really do have to make the most of it when you're getting out there. You know, you've got a little bit of a challenge leading into this one. What are some of the strategies to overcome that? Well, in terms of um, having Bub with us or having Bub around in general right now. Yeah, like I envisage, I've seen a lot of your videos and I'm guessing you spend a lot of time out in the bush scouting and getting there. Are you doing the same amount of time because you've got the new baby? Yeah, I guess it'd be be close to as much time as what I did before, but um, like I took uh, a total of four weeks off when he was born and uh, we're both chatting before about being school teachers, so we're coming towards the end of our summer um, holiday break. So since he's been born, I've only been at work for about six weeks out of a total of three months. So I've had a decent amount of time there. My wife and I haven't necessarily made a massive effort to to change things. It's more just making sure we're organized enough that I can get out. Like, And, and I guess a lot of it comes down to how we communicate with your partner too, like We've had this chat many times before we had um, our boy that uh, we can't afford to just stop all the things that we like to do because we have a kid. But at the same time, we live rural, so I've got spots I can go hunting anywhere from literally the next door neighbors to about an hour and a half away. So I can even wake up at about three thirty, four o'clock, head out for a quick hunt, cut some firewood and come back and I'm home by late morning. Um, so my wife's very understanding in that sense. And then at the same time, if I come in late from a hunt and, and she's been up, you know, feeding Bub or whatever and he's a bit grizzly and he won't quite go down, well, then I'll just take him for however long it takes to put him down. So we share the load in that sense, um, but it's, I don't know, it, it's not easy, but I think for me and my wife, it's... Um, we're in a pretty good situation because we're both passionate about the hunting in the outdoors. So whatever we need to do to keep doing it with Bubba around now is what we're doing. Yeah, I feel you there. You need to have a great partner and, you know, my wife is absolutely fantastic. I'm a little bit different to you, not living rural, living here in Sydney. My closest is probably, well, with the bow it's over an hour, but uh, that's really hard to get. There's only like two spots in both forests and one's um, only weekdays, so it doesn't help when you're working. But 
generally it's sort of probably three and a half hours at least at the min- like sort of minimum. So it's a decent yeah. hike for me to get to where I sort of want to go to hunt. So that's been a real big challenge I've noticed in that. So I'm really happy and excited this year. The wife and I have got the plan so I can get out a lot more and the kids are coming into a good age. They're not that, you know, they're walking and it's not as reliant on having to have two people to hold them. I suppose that's the thing about twins when, you know, very hard to hold two at the same time and give a bottle to two at the same time and things like that. So it makes it uh, a bit more of a challenge. So let's get into the rut strategy, mate. So how are you approaching and what do you do to be as successful as you are? Okay, well, um, the first thing I need to say is that uh, I am fairly successful or I have been in the past with rifles, not so much with the bows yet, but it's a combination of probably majority being lucky to live where I live and have really good access and then a bit of, um, you know, working hard tacked onto the end there. So I've had a yarn about this kind of thing in different places beforehand. Like essentially all I'm doing from in January and February is just trying to find the highest concentration of the does. I'm not going looking for bucks. I do see bucks in velvet when I'm out and about. And if I get out here in the next couple of weeks, I might even try and stalk one or two with my bow. But I'm just trying to keep an eye on where all the does are and also keep in mind where the best water is and the best feed is because the chance, like if the water and the feed stays pretty consistent between now and the middle of April, the chance of the does drastically altering their movements is really slim. So I basically just work on the fact that if I know where there are plenty of does, bucks will show up to breed with those does. Uh, It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Because I've been hunting the same few properties a lot the last, I don't know, five, six, I guess seven years now, I've got a very good understanding about where the best uh, pads are, where the best water is. So I'll put out a whole bunch of cameras, not so much looking uh, for the does specifically, but just trying to get a bit of an idea about patterning their behavior a little bit more than what I might have known, you know, come September, October, especially with the way the seasons change. It was just so dry in my area up until about the middle of October, and now we've got feed coming out of our ears. So that's spread them out a little bit here and there. Um, and I like to have cameras out just to try and count the number of different bucks I may see moving through my area because even though say in the middle of the peak rut I may lay eyes on I don't know it might be a dozen different bucks over the course of the couple of weeks I'd be out hunting it's not uncommon to see 20 or 30 more even on my cameras Uh, but they might like I might get a couple of pictures of one buck at 3 a.m and that's all I see of him you know so I like to just see who's moving through and try and keep tabs on that but uh, again, very lucky with the spots I have access to. It's not so much about finding where a buck is going to be. It's more about just um, putting myself in a situation where I can enjoy the whole thing and um, almost you know, relax a little bit more about it. But again, the, the more I've tried with um, my traditional bows, I've put a lot more pressure on myself to try and get one and I still haven't got one with the trad bow. So I'm taking a compound out for the first time this coming rut and um, – yeah, again, just thinking about the good travel corridors, um, the best spots for feed, and um, keep in mind the best scrapes as well. Like the bucks will make scrapes and they like to hang around there during the rut. I won't go into a heap of detail because I'm you know, far from an expert in that sense. But if you can find some really good scrapes in the scrub, even in the middle of the rut, just sitting there for a day or two, like the chance of a few bucks walking past and just want to have a check on it are pretty high. So. Yeah, it's, it's just being out there really and getting familiar with the spots is probably the best thing. Yeah, look, I think that there's a couple of things that resonated there with me. It's funny because I talk to a lot of people and they are targeting rubs and scrapes and you've said something a little bit different in that you are looking for the females and that makes sense because the boys are going to go searching for them. So you really, I guess, have an understanding of that. Now, you mentioned feet and looking for good quality feed sources. How do you do that? What are you looking for in the sense of what is a good source of food that you think they're going to be eating at that sort of time of year? Um, mate, you know, the, I've got mates who are cattle farmers and they probably have a better understanding about which grasses are, are the best quality and that. Like I don't really have that level of understanding. Um, anything with clover is a good a good place to start, but it's less about um, identifying 
the best spots of, of the feed in a literal sense and more thinking about um, particularly with, with fallow, like that's what I've got the most experience with. They're definitely fringe dwellers. They are ruled by their gut very much so. So anywhere where there may be some improved pasture or stuff out in the open, that's where you're more likely to get them feeding. So any of the spots I'm hunting, I'm finding a lot of scrapes inside the ponds or in the scrub, a lot of travel corridors through some of those places and they're good spots for me to put my cameras. But in terms of where they're feeding, I'm just trying to identify the pads that are getting used the most between the larger open areas with decent grass and the scrub where they're going to be uh, bedding. And um, yeah, I mean, some some grass uh, is probably better for them than others. Uh, but in terms of what's being used the most, anywhere on those pads going to or from the food and the bedding areas that has a lot of fresh droppings is indicating that um, those places are getting used a lot more frequently than others. So, I mean, yeah, it's... I'm sure there are people who could answer better in terms of the quality of the grasses and whatever. I have a decent idea that they're going to be coming out of the scrub into some of the open patches unless there's a super abundance of feed. Like in the 2020 rut when COVID was going down, we'd just come out of the worst drought ever and there was more feed around than I'd ever seen. So most of the does at that time were actually hanging out in some of the thicker patches or on top of these ridges on on the properties that I hunt because there was actually enough food in those areas to occupy them. But the more it dries out um, and the more they kind of eat those areas down, then they're going to be um, moving out into the open. The other thing is, you know, depending on where you're hunting, like if you're hunting a lot of private blocks like what I do, it's paying attention to where the stock are as well. So there's a patch of several hundred acres on one of my favorite properties where the farmer usually has cattle in there now, um, but just the way they rotate their paddocks, those cattle are normally pulled out of there um, a couple of weeks before the rut and that's something else that sort of, uh, I don't know whether you'd say it encourages the deer to hang out there, but it makes them more comfortable hanging out in that spot because they're not having to compete with the cattle. So that's just nothing to keep in mind. Okay, so when we talk about hunting strategy here, you've said a couple of like corridors and things like that. Now, you hunt a variety of ways. You use your trad bow, compound bow, and a rifle. When you approach it, are you a sit and wait? Are you a stalk, spot and stalk? How do you approach each one? Are they different? What do you like to do? With the rifle, I don't I don't mean to say that hunting with a rifle is always easy, but I've, I'm so used to getting really close to things now. The rifle for me, it's, it's basically just I walk around until I um, I can usually hear a bunch of croaking in a bunch of different areas, so I might just walk around to a spot where I can get glass on one. If I identify that it's one I want to take, then I'll think about um, getting into the position for a shot. Obviously, keeping the wind in your favour, sure. Fallow's eyesight is a hell of a lot better than what a lot of people give them credit for. If I'm going to be moving through some thick stuff, I'll try to limit the movement um, to when the buck is croaking so then the chance of um, him or more importantly the does that he's with hearing me is is lowered. The more I've tried to sneak in really close to the bucks, the more I've come to learn and plenty of other people um, would have experienced this too. It's it's really less about stalking the buck and more about avoiding all the girls he'll have because the vast majority of times you hear a buck croaking, it's because there are does or at least one doe there that is cycling or coming into heat. So, you know, if I can see the buck while I'm kind of walking in their direction, it could be from a few hundred meters out, I'm still very much glassing regularly, seeing if there are some does off to the side that I haven't been able to see as yet. Because I've been trying to get so close the last few years, a lot of my opportunities have been blown by, you know, I might have been inside 50 meters for hours and I keep sneaking a bit closer and closer and then I, there's a doe, you know, off to my side that I hadn't seen and they'll screw it up. So with a rifle, yeah, it, I'm lucky again. I, I get to just basically walk around anything within 200 meters is... um pretty easy for me to get after. With the trad bows, I like to be inside 20 meters. I've only ever let two arrows go at bucks over the uh, four years or five years, maybe four or five I've been hunting with a trad bow and uh, both unfortunately just hit straight in a, a shoulder blade uh, or in the ridge of the shoulder and the arrow is kind of barely even penetrated. 
both completely different situations. It's just coincidental that that's the way it's gone. But I need to be – like if I'm inside 30 metres with a trad bow, I feel like I've still got over 10 metres to go. So a lot of that might be sitting and waiting. A lot of it might be um, putting myself in spots where rattling or doe calling is potentially going to be pretty effective. And with a compound, I'm basically going to approach it the same way as what I normally would with a trad bow. I've just got a further effective range. Um, but what I think is going to make the biggest difference for me this year is the fact that I can get to full draw and stay there for 30 seconds or a minute without too much hassle. Whereas with my trad bow, staying at full draw even for 10 seconds can be uh, pretty ruthless. So I should be able to, um, yeah, should be able to position myself fairly well and again hoping um, fairly early to try be successful with some rattling and then later on um, when I can't rattle as well or the bucks aren't as responsive just try to sneak in as close as I can and see what happens. All right perfect you talked about rattling and calling then can you give us some ways that you like to do it so when you're rattling do you like to use antlers do you use like I've got a rack and roll that I like to use what how do you approach that and how often do you do it? Do you space it out? Do you do it quite um, aggressively? What have you found that sort of works for you? I um, I don't know if you can get them here anymore, but uh, I bought off an eBay store a handful of years ago, something called a pack rack. I think it's like made by Night and Hail pack rack or something. And um, yeah, some people prefer to use real antlers. I'm not experienced enough to be able to tell whether real antlers or this thing make a difference. I think that any time... It works or doesn't work has more to do with the time of the year and the mood of that particular buck than anything else. Um, the earlier in the rut, the better because the bucks are still kind of traveling around and trying to compete for the does. So the chance of, um, if you're just sitting having a rattle, a chance of a, a buck moving around or, or cruising around and hearing a biff and wanting to be involved because he thinks there might be some girls over there to fight for is much higher. Whereas later in the rut, usually you'll see the bucks with a whole bunch of does mobbed up and they're far less inclined to want to leave all those does to get into a fight. Having said that, it can work at all times. Like I've I've rattled some bucks in very late in the rut when I've been lucky enough to get between them and their girls. They may have um like they may have chased off a much younger buck or something and they've kind of run past me. So then when I let out a couple of rattles they thought that another couple of bucks that were on their way in to steal their girls rattling at scrapes is is usually um a good strategy as well again the earlier in the rut the better i don't really have a strategy in terms of how much or how little i'm going to rattle it just depends if it's early in the rut and by that i mean anytime after about the 20th of march or so i'll walk through the scrub and get to some big scrapes and i might just have a bit of a rattle what i call a blind rattle in that i've never I haven't seen any any bucks or anything yet. I just want to do that just to see if something comes in. That has worked in the past. I've also been able to see bucks from a couple of hundred meters off and try to rattle them in and haven't been successful and then, you know, gotten 150 meters closer and that's piqued their interest more and I've seen them come in that way. Particularly uh, when I've got the bow with me, it's much more critical, I guess. To I mean, it's always critical to pay attention to the wind, but um, if a buck, like I, if I want a buck inside 20 meters of me, any amount of wind gusts that might go in in his direction is going to screw it up for me. Whereas with one that's much further away, um, the chance of getting the drop on him with a rifle is much higher. Doe calling, if the rattling isn't quite as um, effective as you'd like it to be, trying to make some doe calls, just have a look on YouTube and have a listen or a watch because it it may th- make the buck think he's left a couple of does behind somewhere so you might want to come in and have a bit of a look every time i'm i'm rattling or something like that trying to trying to get the buck to come my direction i'm doing my best to sit with a whole bunch of cover behind me maybe a little bit in front but that can be problematic if you need to shoot through it or move but it's it's always fun when you can see them coming towards you and sometimes they come in really really fast but then you also have to be mindful of the fact that they're looking for something and a lot of them can be silly during the rut, sure, but um, they're not so dumb that they're going to – well, I actually have seen some really silly, but for the most part, you're not just going to be able to get away with a whole bunch of movement and you're sent and doing silly things. So the second you see them start coming, um, start getting ready um, because they'll be on top of you really quickly a lot of the time and um, you'll need to take the first opportunity they give you. Do you croak? Yeah, I, um, I've got one of those big horn – 
callers um, that Toby and Mitch have put out, and I've um, I've had a little bit of success croaking, but I I can't tell whether the success I've had. And just to clarify on the success, like even though I haven't shot one with a bow the last handful of years, I've still taken a couple with rifles or I've guided friends of mine or my wife onto some. So I've still been involved with plenty hitting the deck, but I kind of supplement croaking with some of the doe calls or with some of the rattles. And I don't, yeah, I mean, it sometimes it looks like it rolls them up. Sometimes um, it looks like it doesn't do anything. And other times I've had a buck right on top of me and it's hard to say whether it's been because of the croaking or the doe calling or the rattling. So if it's early in the rut and I can see one from a fair way off, even if I don't have any intention on killing him, I might still muck around and make a bunch of croaks or doe calls and see if I can get his attention and just see the way he might react to it because I mean, they're all individuals. They've all got their own personalities. Some are, um, I heard Aaron Snyder talk about it in the same way of hunting elk on his podcast uh, a few times where he mentioned it's it's like a bar. Like there's a whole bunch of blokes in the bar and there's a whole bunch of girls there and all the blokes are competing for all the girls. Some of those blokes might be full of drink and they want a biff. Some of them might be happy to sit back and just let things play out and there'll be plenty of everything in between. So sometimes you might just get a really aggressive buck and he'll want to come in and in which case enjoy the show. Um, if you've got one that just will not come in, then it's just a case of getting close enough, giving yourself enough of a shot opportunity through a corridor in the scrub or in the open or wherever you're going to be hunting. Yeah. It's interesting. I listen to obviously a lot of podcasts as well and a lot of them talk about the hearing of deer is very similar to owls and that if you can hear it, they can hear it. So sometimes it's not – you're not going to be calling something in from a long, long way away. So I found that interesting that they're going to have to be in that vicinity. And then that makes a lot of sense, like what you were saying there about rattling over a scrape because you're going to think that there are going to be boys around that scrape because they're obviously accessing it some time. What's your theory on the rut? As in, we, we all know it comes from a photo period, but are there other elements that influence it on what time it actually occurs? In terms of anything else that might influence the time, I would say is that a cold snap, a, a, a rut is not dependent on a cold snap, but a cold snap may have you see more activity. And that's, uh, I mean, in my opinion, and I've had this chat with a few people and they feel similarly, it's just to do with the fact that if the deer are more comfortable, they're more likely to be more active. Like up in up where I live, some of the places I hunt are, are pretty cold. If you get a, a frost sort of in that early to mid-April, um, you'll typically hear a lot more activity on that morning. But it, it's not because it's had anything to do with the fertility of the deer or the success rates with the breeding or anything. I think it's just more to do with the fact that girls are happier to be out a bit longer and feeding a bit longer. So the bucks are out and about more. At the same time, the last few years I've hunted some days in the rut that have been over 30 degrees Celsius. So basically, as soon as the sun comes over the horizon, the deer start getting too hot and they just go to bed. So that's what I reckon. The other thing that might have something to do with the timing, not so much of the rut as a as an event, but the timing of the things in your area is how long ago the does dropped their fawns. Because um, a doe that maybe dropped her fawns, uh, her fawn, you know, uh, much closer to the rut starting, it might take her a little bit longer to start cycling again. Whereas a doe that dropped um, her fawn very early in that period when they're dropping their fawns, she may come into cycle a fair bit earlier. And then, you know, whether environmental conditions feed and access to water play a little bit of a part in that. I'm not sure. Obviously, a doe that gets bred later in the rut will probably drop her doe, um, her fawn later in that period compared to other ones. And that's just what I've discovered or at least discussed with other people who hunt in my area. Um, I also alluded to it on that Facebook page the other day where the day's shortening does trigger the does to start cycling, but we have to remember that there are fellow in um, – you know, parts of Victoria and there are fallow in parts of southern Queensland and there's a really long distance between those two places. So the days are going to get to that point that might trigger the um, does a little bit earlier in the year. It might only be by a week. I, I don't know for certain, but I just know the days will shorten in the far south of Australia before they shorten in sort of central Australia. So that's something else that might have a bit of an impact on it. And you see that in North America as well when they talk about their – um. Their white tower ruts, for example, you see people in the 
far north, um, having a rut happen much earlier than the people in those southern states. Looking at everything, I don't think it's an exact science and it does change a little bit in the timings. Like if it's if it happens, if you think it starts like that real prime rut pe- um, period, do you think it's starting on the 13th of that month? From everything that I've encountered and people I've spoken to, doesn't mean it's necessarily going to happen on the 13th the next year. So there's a little bit of fluctuation that can move and different things to sort of impact it. So that's really, really interesting. Now you touched on the fellow deer hunters group there on Facebook that we uh, we both are a part of and you're very active on there and I love that you're one of the top contributors. There's been a lot of conversations going on about different things there and I really wanted to touch on eating the meat because everybody knows I am all about the meat and the antlers are a bonus but it's meat first. And a lot of people, and I've had guests on the podcast as well that have spoken about this, they don't eat rutting barks. They reckon it's absolute terrible meat. Uh, I know your opinion differs slightly. Let's have a bit of a chat about that. Uh, no worries, mate. Yeah. And, and uh, while we're getting into this as well, like I, I do want to say, I'm not a I'm not a professional butcher or meat processor by any means. And I'm also not saying, I don't want anybody to get the impression that I'm going to sit here and say a yearling doe and an eight-year-old buck, they're both just as good as each other. Like That's not the case. Um, but I just... Uh, when people say things like they're not fit to eat or they're not fit for human consumption or whatever, I just I disagree because I've eaten dozens of them. Uh, my wife has, and a lot of our friends and family have, and I haven't really had anybody whinge or, or complain about it being bad. I don't know how I feel on the subject because it it confuses me a little bit. In one breath, I don't understand how we as hunters can complain about aerial culling and leaving animals to rot and then in the next breath when we talk about a ruddy bark that oh we're not going to use the meat because it's not as good as a a yielding doe and I mean everybody understands that side of it no one would be saying that you're saying that a an eight-year-old buck is going to be as delicious as a yearling because that obviously doesn't happen and you look at that in farming and, and the like so I understand what you're saying is that the meat isn't that bad that you can't eat it there's definitely ways you can go about cooking it and changing the flavor profile. And that might be through stews, curries, whatever it might be. Yeah. As I said, I'm really confused because it's sort of our argument as a hunter falls down if we're saying, oh, that meat we can't eat. Or I have seen people say that that meat I wouldn't even give to my dogs. Yeah, mate. And look, I, I'm some of the, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to go out of my way to say things here to be deliberately provocative and try to annoy people. I'm just having a yarn with you and if that if that does annoy people, I'm sorry. But I think a bit of it – it's not like I think that a lot of us are soft, but I think it's certainly – like it doesn't matter where you come from in Australia. Um, in terms of abundance of food – uh, what we have access to as a society, you could, you know, be very low in the poverty line. You could be filthy, stinking rich, but the vast majority of us have a reasonable supermarket or butcher shop pretty close to us, and we can go and afford to buy even, um, you know, fairly high quality beef mince, for example. And there are plenty of parts of the world that, um, you know, where there are huge populations who wouldn't even be able to dream of having that kind of abundance of food or or opportunity. I um I was involved in taking a, a bunch of kids on an excursion to a big sheep abattoir a handful of years ago and I was watching them kill really old rams and they were boning them out hot and all of that meat was getting exported but they were even getting the spines and the pelvises and all these bones with just skerricks of meat left on them and I asked the people in the processing plant where they were going and they said, well, they all these are getting shipped over to China. They all get back sealed and some of the people in the poor areas will put that in a soup and that's all the meat that they're going to get for that day. And, you know, it's it's normal for me to eat one or two kilos of meat in a day. So, we're very lucky here. Um, the other part of the equation is that uh, being in Australia is an interesting situation because you know it wasn't that long ago the only people here were aboriginal australians and all they did was hunt and fish um, to get their protein and i'm not sure um, any of those people you know killed a massive buck kangaroo and said i'm going to leave this thing here um, and i'm going to go get a nice young one because it's going to taste better 
And uh, an interesting parallel with that situation is the fact that the vast majority of animals that we're hunting, like in terms of like that I'm hunting or us as hunters and what that means in Australia in a contemporary sense, they're either from Asia or plenty of them are from Europe. And the same thing, like if you were to tell a European that you shot a, a dozen pigs over a weekend and you left them all to rot or you know, you left the big boars because they stink or the big stags or the big bucks, they'd probably look at you like you've got three heads. And I do need to say, like, I don't eat all the pigs I should. I eat plenty of them. I don't eat all of them. Same as the goats. There's something something much more off-putting about a big billy goat to a big fallow buck to me, put it that way. But uh, So to kind of come full circle on that little um, half of a rant there, I think calling a soft is probably the wrong way to go about it, but I don't, I don't know if our palate's really... <laughs> too far removed from um, our ancestors in the sense that we, you know, have to leave every rutting animal to waste is what I'm getting at. Yeah, the privileged side of things is that we do have such good access to high-quality meat and our, uh, I guess, financial position of everybody in the country is most people can afford meat quite easily, I should say. And it might, might not be the top cuts of different things, but they still would be able to afford something to eat that meat compared to some of the other countries. And it's interesting, I make a parallel with carp and, you know, they're an invasive species here in Australia. You want to remove them from the waterway. Well, legally, if you catch them, you have to, you can't put them back in. That is one thing because overseas, there's a lot of countries that eat a lot of carp. And here you mention eating carp and people obviously straight away turn their nose up at it. And I do feel that's the fact that we are so blessed to be in this country that we have such access to good quality proteins and whether it be fish, whether it be meat, it doesn't matter. So um, that definitely helps. Now let's talk about the butchering side. So a lot of people I've spoken to have talked about bucks and the big problem is maybe coming down to the butchering skills is that the meat is being tainted because we know during that period the outside of the buck they're you know they're going to be covered in urine they're going to be covered in mud that's that smell and it's not a great smell if that gets on the meat that's obviously going to make it a lot worse do you think that's one of the reasons that if people are getting that really bad flavour, it could be on the back of just poor knifemanship skills? Yeah, Matt, I, I really do think that's one of the issues. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the only reason something may taint because I've you know, been very lucky to <laughs> be, have cut up a lot of fallow deer and the older bucks, particularly in the rut, do have a bit of a different smell about them, but it's it's nothing that's so horrible that I think it's off-putting taken just by itself, um, especially as somebody who eats a lot of lamb, like I love lamb. Lamb stinks and I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just got a very, very strong smell to it. So um, what I'm saying is a lot of different meats just have their own smell and it doesn't necessarily mean it's some horrible, rutty kind of smell. But yeah, like uh, before I got good at this stuff, um, not that I'm an expert now, but I, I didn't think as much about how much scent was on my hands when I'd be cutting up some of these deer. And now I've often got my wife with me or, or a mate, you know, or maybe my dad. Like the, I take a lot of care to make sure I'm not only doing a bunch of the skinning first and then cleaning my hands and doing a bunch of the processing afterwards. But even things like if I'm skinning a back leg, I might grab – a piece of the skin and I might hang on to that piece of skin until I've skinned the membrane far enough back that the skin will then hang over itself backwards under its own weight, if that makes sense. I'm not kind of like grabbing a piece and then letting it go and having that tainted skin fall back on top of the meat and then doing that over and over again. It sounds like a massive pain. It's really not if you take your time. I mean, there are plenty of, you know, some people might want to just gut something and, and hang it up and leave the skin on too, which which can work. It's a different way of aging it, but I don't necessarily have that luxury a lot of the time. So it's very much um, about taking them apart where they fall and doing my best to keep my hands clean, my knife clean, and after I've done the dirty stuff, um, cleaning it up really well and then um, getting them into game bags. How do you age it? Just It sounds like you don't have a chill or anything like that. Oh, I've got a um, – I've got like a – I guess it's – somebody would refer to it as a drink fridge, like just a big fridge with a big glass door on the front. I bought it off 
marketplace. Um, I'll just put stuff in there. I've I've hung smaller deer in there with the skin on before. You can't. I can't hang them from the back legs. I have to hang them from the pelvis because it's not quite big enough. Like I've got a, a lamb in there right now, which is hung from the pelvis. Obviously, skin off with the lamb. Um, most of the venison I eat is basically taken apart in big bits in the field, front legs, back legs, back straps, um, tenderloins, whatever else, and I just put it into breathable synthetic game bags and I leave it in that fridge for, I don't know, minimum five days before I process it, sometimes 10 days. And then after I process it, I might, like I vacuum seal everything, I might leave it in the fridge a little bit longer, maybe another week before I freeze it or I might just freeze it immediately. It's basically whatever I feel like doing. I haven't got a a set formula as such. I saw some people on that post I made actually talk in a lot more detail about the way they cool it down and the pH levels and all that. And that's fantastic. Like people should definitely pay attention to that stuff. I'm not saying I don't pay attention because I don't want to. I'm just saying I've never really gone into that level of detail. I just try and take it off clean get it in breathable game bags, get it in that fridge and go from there. I know Meat Eater had some really good ones on that, how they, they got, I think, a meat scientist in and they talked about what's going on and what's the best way. And there's – you mentioned hanging by the pelvis and that was, I guess, probably – I've seen a lot of people starting to use that method because they actually say during when the animal's breaking down, those enzymes, it's more natural rather than hanging from the legs. So the legs are able, that those muscle, as it breaks down and manoeuvres, like obviously goes through rigor mortis, then relaxes again, that it's actually better for the meat if you're hanging it from the pelvis. So it's interesting that you you do that. So it's probably not a bad thing from everything that I've, I've read that's out there. What else is there when you're talking about butchering and things to make your life a bit easier? What kind of knife do you use? Do you hang it in the field? Are you doing it on the ground? I... I use knives made by a friend of mine called Jason. Um, he's got a company called Seekert Knives, S-E-E-K-E-R. They are phenomenal. They're the best knives I've used personally. And they're, you know, they're pretty hard, high-quality steel. Like I think most of them are S35 VN. But I'm also not going to sit here and say you need a super expensive knife because I've, I used to experiment with all kinds of knives. So anything from cheap Victories and Victinox and... Um, in stainless steel and and Dexter Russells in carbon steel and anything in between. Um, As long as your knife is sharp, that's the most important thing. I'm not about to sit here and say that if you haven't got this particular shape or something that you're screwed because, you know, I've done it with pocket knives before. As long as your knife is super sharp, it's just going to make your life a heap easier. If you don't know how to sharpen a knife, then, you know, watch some tutorials and, and start to get a bit of an understanding. Even buy like a cheap FDIC or Victory or Victrinox boning knife and just experiment because the longer you leave a knife um, without sharpening it, the duller it's going to get and the more painful it's going to be in the field and the longer it's going to take to get that edge back. Um, And I've seen plenty of people, particularly when, like I don't really gut that many animals. I tend to just use a a gutless style method but... um, if I'm going to hang a small enough one at home, and certainly in the drought when I was culling deer like mad, I was I would gutting them and hanging them because I was shooting most of them in the head anyway. But the skin around the anus is really stretchy, and uh, man, like I've, I've seen so many people try and cut around the the anus like that, and with a dull knife, they're they're basically just pushing the skin around. It's just it's so much more problematic, and plenty of people. You know, with respect to them, like they actually don't know what a really sharp knife feels like because they've just bought a knife from the shop and they've had a bit of a crack with it. And every time I hand one of my knives to somebody to have a bit of a go at skinning or something, they comment how easy it is because it's razor sharp. So I'm also a little bit mad in that uh, even when I go on backpack hunts in the backcountry, I will carry a small butcher steel with me. And every now and then I'll just give a knife a bit of a, a lick on that steel. It's it's a bit of extra weight to carry, sure, but um, you know, if, if you're taking apart a lot of animals, it's nice to be able to maintain that knife, uh, maintain that edge. And again, the more you maintain it as you go, the you won't have to hit it on a stone for anywhere near as long. Even if my boots are pretty clean and they're, and they're made out of leather, I'll actually, um, in the middle of uh, butchering some critters, I might even strop my knife on my boots just to kind of clean some of the dried, crusty bits of blood off it and just... Uh, keep that edge a little bit more polished. I know it sounds silly, but 
I really believe every little bit counts when it comes to knife maintenance and I've I've spent too much time mucking around with dull knives to want to want to do it again. So I also carry a little Falkneven stone with me that's diamond on one side and ceramic on the other and there's a bunch of them out there. I think Taito make one and so like, you know, carry one of those and know how to use it because the thing is like if you're if you're making a couple of cuts and your knife is razor sharp, a really tough steel will definitely hold its edge a little bit longer. But if you are a bit of a novice and you don't know how to get through the joints properly, for example, and you saw away at those joints, then you're still going to make it dull. I don't care how good the knife steel is. Um, like I said, some knives will, will go dull um, faster than others, but knowing where to cut and then maintaining your knife are very important. So you are making or you've got plans to make a few videos in regards to this which i think is such an excellent idea and you know the more resources out there the better in my opinion what other things are you going to be sort of talking about and looking at for those videos to just put some information out there at the hands of people and i guess you're like me being a teacher you like to try and get some education out there as well and i'm guessing that's why you're doing this yeah mate it's it's uh nothing to do with trying to um communicate with people that I'm some kind of big expert because I'm not. I'm just very lucky that I've done it plenty and I do enjoy I do enjoy educating people. And if it helps a bunch of other hunters, um, be that, you know, uh, be they really experienced or complete novices, if it if anybody gets anything out of it, then that makes me feel good. But yeah, they're like I've I see a lot of people they'll they'll have a deer on the ground. If they want to hang it, they'll just put a knife straight through um between uh where that Achilles tendon is and they'll want to hang it up like that straight away when the hair, uh, the fur or the skin is still down that part of the leg and then it's a real tricky business trying to skin around where the gambrel is or wherever you're hanging it. So, I mean, people can watch videos online now um, of people like slaughtering lambs at home, like commercial um, or home slaughtermen and the way they do that section, they actually skin the ankle joint first so that's something I'll cover, and that's it's just a, a little trick. Um, it also makes it easier to cut the the joints out because rather than just guess where the joint is on the skin, you're actually exposing the joint more, so you can see where the cuts need to be made. And as well, a lot of people will just go straight on that joint and cut it with their knife. And even though the hair isn't super long there, you do that a handful of times, and that hair will dull your knife a little bit. So just exposing that joint is a good trick. Another example is um, I see a lot of people in person and on uh, the internet leaving behind a lot of the meat when they're taking the back leg off, like they leave a lot of that rump behind. And it's not like again, it, it's not like leaving some meat on the bones is going to land you in jail, or uh, you know you might have some keyboard warrior want to criticise you. But if you're taking meat home and you're eating it and you and your family are happy, that's super good. But Taking as much meat back as possible with the same amount of knife cuts is um, it's a good skill to have. And uh, like I mentioned to you before, I've actually got a few different deer pelvises um, that I've collected over the years that I've boiled out or I've found them in the scrub. So I actually want to put them on video and show people what the shape is. So because uh, when you first like when I first started cutting the back legs off of animals, I, I you know, I just wanted to get in there, find the ball and socket joint, and then once I've got through that, I just start hacking. And as soon as I come out the other side, then I'm golden. But it's uh, if you have a good idea in your head of what the pelvis actually looks like, then you have a much better idea about where you need to run your knife. And um, yeah, and that that rump piece that plenty of people leave behind is one of my favourite bits to eat. So that's something I'll cover. Besides that, oh, I might cover some skinning techniques again of stuff I picked up from killing sheep at home, like punching a lot of the skin off as opposed to um, using a knife. Just does a little bit cleaner job, particularly if you want to tan your skins. If you can take your skin off in the field and leave the absolute bare minimum of flesh on there as opposed to um, the opposite, then it's going to be much easier for you to clean it and tan it when you get home as opposed to have to spend ages fleshing it or hitting it with a high-pressure cleaner. Um and then probably after that, mate, just uh, again, because they're ruddy bucks, they're not necessarily as tender or um, or as mild in flavor as a younger deer. So I might go over a few things that, like just favorite recipes that my wife and I do that are massive crowd pleasers um, that we do with, yeah, the rankiest, most, um, you know, 
pea covered bucks you could possibly imagine where we feed them to friends and family who they're not even hunters um and they couldn't you know they wouldn't even know that it's a ruddy buck or a young deer so just some yeah sous vide stuff some pressure cooking stuff um stuff with some really big flavors i'm half lebanese so i'll I'll put some um you know arabic inspired recipes in there and just have a bit of a a mini series about some some techniques and things that i do or i've picked up and turn it into really good tucker uh, look, I think that's great. It's one of those things, the more information that's out there, like you don't have to agree with everything that's out there or it might just challenge your thought process and you might pick up a tip or a trick or you might not pick up anything. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. As long as I'm a big proponent of people having a go and trying to learn and and try different methods and things like that. So I think it's great that you're putting everything out there. And it was one of the reasons I started the podcast is to get different ideas and chat to different people and because I've obviously got my thoughts and opinions and learn and grow as a human as well because I think sometimes we get so a lot of people get so pigeonholed is that they have a view and they go that's my view and I'm not going to ever change that thought process or my opinion is my opinion and I think that's a trap that I think you should be always looking to extend that and grow. Now, do you think, I want to go back a little bit because you were talking about the smell of lamb previously. Do you think that one of the reasons maybe adding to the people not wanting to eat, you know, ruddy buck or that smell is because it is very few and far between in this country of people processing their own meat? So I'll put my hand up. I have never processed a lamb. I've never processed, you know, a beast, a steer or anything like that. So... I would have no idea what that smelt like at the time of butchering. I'm only purchasing that meat at the end of the uh, journey. So I couldn't compare them to anything else. Do you think that has a really big influence on people? Yeah, mate. It's hard to it's hard to say for certain, but I, I really think that that does have a lot to do with it just because it's um, – like I don't – when people want to – uh, lecture me, uh, lectures at the right, but when people want to say things like, oh, geez, you know, like, no way I'd eat a ruddy buck. I'm like, well, that's fine. Like, I'm not saying what you what you have to do and what you don't have to do, but I think just in general exposure to, to those kinds of smells and, all, and uh, you know, the way things feel when you touch them, whatever, like we're just, we don't have many people in society, obviously besides hunters, um, doing it now. And I remember like my... um grandfather on my mum's side my Lebanese grandfather I never met him he died before I was born but he used to it's very very wog I know like used to kill his own lambs in his yard and and butcher them up with his family and a few years ago now I was out um, with a few of my uncles and cousins um, and I shot a goat in the head with a rifle and we hung it up in a tree and I was just uh, pulling the guts out and my uncles commented that the smell they were getting was exactly the same as the smell from when you know my grandfather used to kill lambs in his backyard, and it's not like it's not like it's this horrible, gross smell. Like I mean, I've probably done far to smell worse than this, objectively speaking, you know. But it's just a smell that people don't don't come across very often. Um, it's the same, uh, maybe, but worse when when gutting pigs. Like when if anybody who's ever opened up a pig, wild or domestic, they have a very different smell inside them compared to a deer or um other ruminants maybe and it again it's it's not necessarily gross it's just the way it is but because most people these days don't have to think about any of those weird smells or whatever they can just go to a supermarket and buy the meat i think a lack of exposure is is what sort of um makes people take take a step back when they do smell something a little bit funky um which is interesting to me because even the in the kangaroo meat industry, for example, like they're all wild harvest and a lot of the uh, biggest bucks are getting shot in that space because it's in the harvester's best interest to shoot the bigger ones because they're getting paid by the kilo. Um, I've been involved in some of that stuff before and um, I've smelt uh, you know, kangaroo at restaurants or that mates have bought at supermarkets. I'm sitting there thinking, it smells just like when I was eating that paddock the other night, you know, and to me it kind of smells gross, but it's Gross isn't the right way to put it. It's more like it's a smell that I'm not used to smelling when I'm thinking about food. It's more when I'm thinking about getting my hands dirty, you know. But uh, again, it's 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 hard to say whether one smell is better or, or worse than another, except for maybe billy goats because that's just 
yeah, they really do stink. But <laughs> And some pigs I've come across that have been rolling around in dead animals, they stink pretty bad too. But that's why I always bring up lamb as an example because people always want to ask me, is venison gamey? And I say, well, yes and no. It depends what you think gamey is. I, I think the, that um, the difference between lamb and beef for example, is probably a, a bigger difference in terms of smell than the difference between a lot of venison and beef. It's just my opinion. But, um, man, when my wife and I have been rendering lamb fat at home to make soap and we've got the slow cooker going all day with lamb fat in there, if I come home from work, the entire house stinks of lamb fat. It's a smell I enjoy because it means we're doing some fun stuff, but it's it's a pretty pungent, funky, in-your-face sort of smell, you know, Um but people are just familiar with it because plenty of Aussies eat lamb, so don't think about it as being strong. Yeah, I think it's really big, the people, what they're accustomed to and they're used to it as opposed to what they're not. And I think that's where the game meat flavour is. It's just a different flavour. It's not so much gamey, as you mentioned with kangaroo, because there's a lot of people that won't eat kangaroo because that's that flavour is a lot different to beef and lamb that we're sort of used to eating. So I can understand that. Mate, one thing I want to touch on is your thoughts around bleeding an animal out. So do you tend to shoot through the lungs? I'm guessing, you, obviously, you try to with the bow. But if you're shooting something with the rifle, uh, is it a headshot you mentioned before? Do you sometimes do it through the lungs? And then is there a different way for bleeding? Do you bleed? Um, it all depends on where I hit it, mate. So, like, again, I'm not trying to sound like a big hero because I sometimes spotlight deer, but I do sometimes spotlight deer, particularly if some of the landowners want some venison. So I might just drive around with a light roller couple and um, and yeah, give them to the landowner after I've processed them. And it's... it's um, I don't really call it hunting, but I don't shy away from telling people about it because if I had to choose between going to the supermarket and, and buying some minced meat or um, going for a drive and shooting a couple of deer, then I'd definitely take the latter. Having said that, if I shoot anything through the chest, heart, lungs, um, whether it's with an arrow or a bullet or whatever, I don't typically cut the throat to bleed it because the animal has bled out in the cavity anyway, especially when it comes to being hit with an arrow. Like That's how they die. They lose blood whereas if you shoot something through the shoulders with a big rifle they might bleed out a little bit but if you take out the spine as well then they've also like been killed as a result of that trauma to their spinal column but certainly something in the head like we're not to go back to the spotlighting like if i'm driving around and i shoot anything in the head or even with my lambs um at home like uh my wife will dispatch one with a 22 at point blank to the head and then I'll come in and slit the throat because the heart is still pumping. So um, I've done that plenty of times with deer. If I hit them in the head and I get there quick enough, I'll slit the throat and have them bleed out. If anybody, like if someone shoots something through the chest and they want to cut the throat and sort of hang it up anyway, I mean, it might still help it drain a little bit. I'm not saying it's a complete waste of time, but it's it's not something that I bother doing and it's not something I would say is necessary provided it has bled out effectively from um however you shot it to to kill it. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if you're shooting it through the lungs and it's the, the heart's pumping the lungs, it's just filling up in the cavity. So it's bleeding it just in a different way. You were saying that you use the gutless method? A lot of it depends on where I am, mate. Like it, a lot of the spots I hunt, it's not like they're super, super remote backcountry missions like some of the stuff I've um, done in Victoria after Samba, but if I were to take the time to gut the animal and drag it to where I could get a vehicle, I probably would have been better off just taking it apart, the gutless method, and walking it out and then driving my vehicle as close as I could because dragging a, a whole deer, you know, even a few hundred meters might be problematic in some of the really thick stuff. So most of what I do is definitely the gutless method. But again, if I'm out on what my wife and I might refer to as a, as a meat run or a meat mission and we've – got the light out then yeah i might um shoot a few in the head and drop the guts out of them particularly if i've got somewhere to to hang them like uh, one of the farms where we hunt they do have a cool room so it's easy to hang geez I, I could hang half a dozen in there very easy if i wanted to it's not something i do anywhere near as much it's much less effort to knock the guts out of anything and hang it at that moment but then when the time comes to process it's a little bit more effort than what it would have been otherwise where if I spend a lot of time skinning and taking the meat off on the ground, it takes me a lot longer there. But then when I go to start processing it, um, if I've done a pretty clean job, then I can just go straight from there. And look, to each to their own, eh? Like it's, 
I'm not going to say one way is better than another. Um, I have eaten venison that's hung in a cool room for 10 days with the skin on and um, skinning it was annoying because of how cold it was but then a vacuum seal that up and it was some of the best venison I have ever eaten. But that's also a little bit harder to come at for more people because it's you know a lot of us don't have the space to do that. So I don't want anyone to think that if they skin the legs out on the ground and take the back straps out and then take the tenderloins out and just put them in a fridge or even keep them in an esky, um, I don't want anybody to feel like they're going to get a, a lesser quality product. I mean that's that's what makes up. Um, the vast majority of what my wife and I have eaten for the last nearly six years and we've done just fine. Again, it just comes down to personal preference and also what you've got access to. As you said, if you don't have a chiller, it makes it a lot harder to hang an animal whole. So then you've, you know, you're restricted in what you can do. So you've got to do what suits you and what suits your environment. And I'm very big on that. I don't like to judge anybody else on what they're doing or how they're doing it because their circumstances might be completely different to me. And I think that's one thing that we should all sort of promote a bit more is that being as a positive community, looking after each other and not judging or viewing people that are doing something different necessarily as wrong just because they might have to do it that way or their circumstances allow for that. So that does definitely make sense. All right, mate. That, uh, geez, I think there's a lot there for people to listen to. I'll, uh, I'm looking forward to listening to it a couple of times, actually, because I think there's a lot of good information coming on the back of you. And as I said at the start, I thoroughly enjoy watching what you put out there and the content that you're making. And, you know, I really can see that passion as a teacher and an educator shining through and, and wanting to help out and, you know, people that might not have the same level of experience. And I love the fact you're saying you're not an expert. I think that term gets thrown around a lot when realistically, just because somebody knows a lot about something doesn't mean that they're 100% right too. So I love the fact that you're just putting things out there for people. If it helps, it helps. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And that way people can pick and choose what they like. So I think that's a really good thing you're doing, mate. Really want to see you keeping doing that up. And I can't wait for those videos to come out. No worries, mate. Thanks for having me on and, and giving me a chance to have a bit of a yarn about this stuff that um you know we enjoy so much. And look, anybody who has any questions or whatever just just find me on instagram or on on the fellow um, facebook page there and hit me up like I've, i spend a lot of time probably too much time <laughs> talking to people on the internet about hunting um, my wife reckons i'm i'm nuts i probably am but again like it, it's it's just about sharing and um like it's not a competition it's just about building the community and if uh, more people can enjoy eating venison or um other stuff that we chase well then the world's gonna be a better place Mate, a rising tide raises all ships. That's what I'm all about. So, mate, keep doing it. I love it. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate you giving up your time and having a yarn to us about all the things that we've spoken about. So, mate, keep doing what you're doing. Love that you're a big contributor in the fellow group and best of luck for the upcoming rut. I can't wait to see some of the things you uh, put on the deck. Cheers, mate. Thank you. All right, listeners. Bye for now. If you have a topic, guest, question, or any gear that you want to hear about on the podcast, shoot us an email, australianhuntingandbeyond at gmail.com. Alternatively, find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All the links are in the show notes. If you haven't already, make sure you give us a review and subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.